So the next question is why do people get problems with stomach acid? So there are multiple reasons for this uh, and you can write a big long list and progressively your list will become more and more esoteric. I'm just going to discuss the two most interesting ones because they're the two most common ones. So I've written down two here, fasting and medication. So let's firstly discuss fasting. So fasting means not eating for an extended period of time, or even worse, not eating and drinking. So there are two types of fasting, water fasting, where you don't eat anything, but you're allowed to drink water. And then the more extreme dry fasting, where you don't eat anything and you're not allowed to drink any liquid at all, no water. Now, both of these can lead to problems with the stomach acid becoming too concentrated. So usually, if you eat three meals a day, you are ingesting that food, that food's going down into the stomach, and that food helps to neutralize the stomach acid. And also, you're drinking regularly throughout the day, and again, the water helps to reduce the concentration of the stomach acid. If you stop eating, then your that effect of neutralizing the stomach acid is taken away and the stomach acid concentration can build up and it, you can become symptomatic from this. So people often find that they will get epigastric pain when they do extended periods of fasting, such as if you fast for 24 hours, most likely by the end of that you will have epigastric pain. In fact, if you don't know what epigastric pain is, that's a way that you can find out. If you, do, if you fast for long enough, you most likely will experience epigastric pain. And people call uh, this pain different things. So one of the things that people will describe it as is hunger pains. When people talk about hunger pains, usually that is uh, stomach acid uh, building up in the stomach, unneutralized, and then irritating the lining of the stomach or irritating the lining of the esophagus or the duodenum. Uh, so that's what people are referring to usually when they talk about hunger pains. The more extreme dry fasting, which I really do not recommend, it's extremely, it can be extremely dangerous, uh, is even worse for doing this. If you don't eat and you don't drink, then you haven't even got the water to help neutralize the stomach acid. Uh, and you're going to get very, very concentrated stomach acid and it will cause you irritation. It will give you really bad uh, epigastric pain. Another term that people can use, which I'll just add onto this list of dyspepsia or epigastric pain, is indigestion. Usually, people can use that term in different ways, but usually, again, it's used in reference to this epigastric, too acidic stomach pain. So I've just added those terms on there. So indigestion, again, this is another term people will commonly use to describe these upper abdominal or lower chest pains that come from uh, stomach acid. And again, hunger pains, these pains that people feel in their upper abdomen and lower chest uh, when they've done an extended period of fasting with no intake of food to help neutralize the acid. So as I say, if you don't know what this pain is, just fast and then you will find out most likely if you fast for long enough. So cause number two, and this is probably the more serious one because this can result in very, very serious problems with stomach acid and is more likely to be the cause of peptic ulcers. So usually when people fast, they don't fast long enough for the stomach acid to actually become dangerous. So it would be very rare for someone to actually get a peptic ulcer just from fasting. Uh, usually it's medications that lead to such dramatic problems with stomach acid that it actually causes ulcerations. So there are a whole bunch of medications that can increase the acidity of the stomach. I've written down a few examples here, so we'll just discuss these. So the first and probably the most famous example would be non-steroidals, meaning non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NZs. So uh, ibuprofen is probably the most famous example, but also naproxen and then, God forbid, diclofenic, the dreaded diclofenic. Um, so... All of these drugs are used as painkillers and as antipyretics. So they help relieve pain and they help make you feel better when you're ill. So if you've got the flu and you're feeling really down, really ill, taking ibuprofen uh, helps you to feel better. Another thing that they're brilliant at is treating arthritis pain, particularly osteoarthritis is one of the things we prescribe them for, but also more complicated forms of arthritis such as rheumatoid arthritis, they can also help hugely with those pains. So joint pains uh, is a common reason that, for instance, naproxen would be prescribed. Diclofenic, especially in the UK, we've really gone off it. 
hardly ever do we ever prescribe diclofenac, but occasionally you do see some people who boldly prescribe it. Uh, but it is really, really strong and probably the worst one of the three that I've mentioned uh, for causing problems with the stomach. So they all have this side effect that they work, they have broad effects all over the body, but one of their side effects is that they work on the lining of the stomach and increase acid production by the lining of the stomach and therefore increase stomach acidity and can therefore result in bad dyspepsia uh, and even peptic ulcers. So uh, we often encourage people to take these drugs with food so you really shouldn't be taking them if you're fasting. That's a surefire way of getting really bad uh, epigastric pain, really bad dyspepsia. We also are very cautious about prescribing non steroidals to older people because older people, you know, their body's more frail, their stomach is slightly more susceptible to getting peptic ulcers. So younger people, if their stomach becomes more acidic, they're probably just going to get pain and irritation from it, but maybe not actually progress to full-on peptic ulcers. Whereas older people, because everything's just a little bit weaker, a little bit more susceptible to damage, uh, they're more susceptible to getting full-on peptic ulcers from derangements of stomach acid. And this is one of the reasons, there are other reasons as well, that we're very cautious about prescribing non-steroidals to uh, elderly people. Uh, really, when I prescribe ibuprofen, ibuprofen is one of the only non-steroidals I ever prescribe. I would never prescribe diclofenac. Sometimes I prescribe naproxen, uh, but ibuprofen is the main one I prescribe. And the people I prescribe it to in hospital are the pediatric patients. We use it all the time in children, as long as they're not asthmatic. Um, and then young adults, so under 50, I would prescribe ibuprofen as long as they're not known to have problems with stomach acid. If, for instance, they're already on a PPI, then I know that that person has problems with stomach acid and therefore I'd avoid non -steroidals. But if they're not on a PPI, they're not known to have problems with this and they're young, then I would prescribe non -steroidals. But as I say, elderly people, we give alternative analgesia, we give paracetamol and opiates. We prefer opiates in elderly people compared to non steroidals because of the side effects, one of which is this stomach acid problem. So next class of drugs to discuss is antibiotics. So there are a huge number of different antibiotics and some are very bad for increasing stomach acidity and some are much less bad for increasing stomach acidity. So the reason that antibiotics can increase stomach acidity is that the stomach is not sterile. There are bacteria that live in the surface of the stomach. And those bacteria, in order to survive in that acidic environment, they have to produce stuff that neutralizes the acid so that their little sphere of inhabitants is a little bit less acidic because they're producing all of the neutralizers to the stomach acid. Now, if you take antibiotics, some antibiotics, but not all antibiotics, will kill the bacteria that live in the stomach. And this is why some antibiotics cause this problem with stomach acidity and others don't. Because remember, different antibiotics hit different spectrums of bugs. So if you take an antibiotic that hits those bugs that inhabit the stomach, then you knock them all out and then their effect, their production of this neutralizing substances is taken away. And then if you imagine normally your stomach produces acid and some of that acid is neutralized by the neutralizing chemicals that these bacteria are producing, if you take away that neutralizing effect, now the stomach produces the same amount of acid, but you don't have the neutralization effect. So overall, the effect is going to be that your stomach is going to become more acidic when you're taking the antibiotic and you don't have those bacteria helping to neutralize it. So antibiotics that hit the bacteria that live in the stomach therefore result in increased stomach acidity and can result in bad epigastric pain and even potentially uh, peptic ulcers if you're very susceptible to that. Finally, the final class that I'm going to discuss, and there are others, you know, we could spend all night uh, discussing classes of medications that increase stomach acidity, but I'm going to end with bisphosphonates. So the most commonly used bisphosphonate in the UK, oh, and by the way, I'll just say one final thing about antibiotics, particularly bad antibiotics for causing epigastric pain are the macrolides, so erythromycin and clarithromycin. 
they are really bad for hitting the stomach bacteria and causing really bad epigastric pain, particularly if you take huge doses of them. So clarithromycin, the dose is normally set. It's usually 500 milligrams twice daily. But erythromycin, if it's used, which it rarely is in the UK, can be given in huge doses. The reason erythromycin is hardly ever used anymore is clarithromycin is more effective at lower doses and it has less side effects. But if for some reason erythromycin is used, uh, it can be given in huge doses compared to the doses of clarithromycin. It can be given in doses of up to one gram four times a day. And if you were to take those sort of doses of erythromycin, I guarantee you, you will get horrific epigastric pain, even if you take it with food, most likely. But if you were to fast whilst taking that, God forbid, you'd be in, you'd be in probably crippled over with pain. Anyway, let's move on. So bisphosphonates. So there are a bunch of these. The most common one prescribed in the UK is alandronic acid. It's a medication that you take once a week, and you can already probably see the problem with these medicines. They are acids themselves, so of course they're going to, when you take them, they're going to increase the acidity of the stomach. Uh, and they're medicines that are used to treat osteoporosis, so they work by stopping bone from being broken down. So normally our bones are not fixed, they remodel continuously, so there are little cells inside the bone that make bone, and there are little cells that take it away and break it down, and our bone is continually being turned over, so in certain areas, bone is being laid down, and in other areas, bone is being taken away. So it's a continual dynamic process of bone being produced and bone being taken away, and bisphosphonates work by inhibiting the cells that break the bone down, so that you just have the cells that are making bone, the osteoblasts, uh, producing bone, but you don't have the osteoclasts, which are destroying bone, taking it away. And this is used to treat osteoporosis, which is a condition that affects many elderly people where their bones become too uh, fragile. They're, they, they're, so in nice young people, uh, there's lots and lots of thick bone, whereas in older people, the bone becomes much thinner. Uh, there's much more holes inside it. Um, so the idea there is to force uh, the bones to get bigger effectively, more dense, by stopping osteoclastic activity and just having osteoblastic activity. And they are effective, they're very effective medications, but their major side effect and the thing that stops people from taking them is that they do produce really bad epigastric pain when you take them. And the problem is that you have to take them on an empty stomach for them to work. So people usually take them once a week, first thing in the morning. And the reason they have to be taken on an empty stomach is that if you take them with food, the calcium and other minerals in the food bind to the alandronic acid and stop it from being absorbed. So that's why you have to take it on an empty stomach. And of course, when you take it on an empty stomach, that effect of irritation is going to be much worse because you've already got a lot of undiluted stomach acid because you haven't eaten yet. And then you're adding in this acidic medication and together their combined effect is going to be very irritating. So they can cause a lot of epigastric pain and potentially even ulcers. And the big worry is that when people take the tablet, if they don't swallow it properly, if it gets stuck in the esophagus, the acidic drug can actually burn a hole in the esophagus itself, uh, causing esophageal ulcers. So that's a massive worry with bisphosphonate. So you're supposed to take it with a huge glass of water to absolutely make sure that it's been washed down into the stomach and it's not sat in the esophagus and going to ulcerate the esophagus. So uh, we'll stop there. Those are the three main classes or three examples of drugs that I want to discuss uh, that can lead to two acidic stomach. So, of course, loads of elderly people are on a huge number of medications, many of which, if you look at the side effects, have stomach acid problems. And therefore, a lot of elderly people will need to be on a permanent PPI to protect their stomach from all the medications they're taking. As I say, there's loads of medicines that we haven't even bothered to talk about here, uh, which are prescribed very regularly, which can cause stomach irritation. Um, and th this is why elderly people who are on lots of medicines are nearly always on a everyday PPI to protect their stomach.